Today I'm going to show you how to do simple food tests with reagents that you can make yourself. All the materials I will be using today can be bought at your local pharmacy or supermarket, which means that you can easily prepare these reagents to perform the food test experiments or set up a practical on a lower budget. The starch test is the easiest one to do, since not a lot of preparation is required. You can simply buy the prepared iodine tincture, and then you need some substance that contains starch. You can use potato starch, corn flour, or any of the various starches that are available in stores today with all the gluten-free options out there. If you opt for the corn flour, mix one teaspoon into 500 milliliters of cold water in a pot and bring that to the boil. If you are using the potato starch, prepare it by dissolving one teaspoon in a cup of cold or lukewarm water. A precaution to note is that iodine stains and can also be an irritant when it comes into contact with skin. So be sure not to spill any of it and clean any apparatus that comes into contact with it quickly. To perform the starch test, add your starchy substance into one test tube and water into another. The water will serve as the control so that we can compare the color changes of the test tubes. Add a few drops of iodine to each test tube. Gently shake the mixtures to allow the iodine to disperse and observe the color change. A brownish yellow color indicates a negative test for starch, whilst the blue black indicates a positive test for starch. For the protein test, you need a protein containing substance like milk or egg whites, and then you need to prepare the two components of the burette reagent. Component A is a solution of copper sulfate. Just dissolve one teaspoon of copper sulfate in about a cup of lukewarm water. Component B is a concentrated caustic soda solution. This is the one chemical that you must be very careful of preparing. Caustic soda is used in drain cleaner and can be bought at your local supermarket in the cleaning aisle. I like to buy one that uses granules because they're easier to work with. Adding caustic soda to water is an exothermic reaction, which means that a lot of heat is dissipated in the process. And if the solution comes into contact with your skin, it's going to burn. So if need be, wear protective gloves and goggles. Precautionary steps here include using cold tap water, never hot water, which would cause the caustic soda to bubble and splatter all over the place. Adding a small amount of caustic soda to a larger quantity of water and never the other way around. So to prepare component B, I add one teaspoon of caustic soda to 500 milliliters of cold tap water and stir until it is fully dissolved. You will also feel the container heat up, so preferably use a glass container of some kind. To perform the protein test, add some milk into one test tube and water into another. The water will again serve as the control. First, add a few milliliters of component A, the copper sulfate solution, to each test tube. Then add a few drops of the strong alkaline component B, the caustic soda solution, to each test tube. Gently shake the mixtures to allow the two components to interact and disperse and observe the color change. A blue color indicates a negative test for protein, whilst violet or purple indicates a positive test for protein. For the glucose test, you need a glucose containing substance like glucose powder or fruit juice, and then you need to prepare the two components of Fehling's solution. Component A is a solution of copper sulfate. Just dissolve one teaspoon of copper sulfate in a cup of lukewarm water. Component B is a mixture of concentrated caustic soda solution and cream of tartar. To prepare component B, I add two teaspoons of caustic soda to 250 milliliters of cold tap water and stir until it is fully dissolved. Then I add five teaspoons of cream of tartar to the solution and stir until it is fully dissolved. Mix equal parts of filling A and B together just before use. You will notice the solution become a deep blue color. 
To perform the glucose test, add some dissolved glucose powder into one test tube and water into another. The water will serve as the control. First, add a few drops of the combined failing A and B solution to each test tube. Then place the test tubes in a water bath with boiling hot water. Allow them to rest in the water for a few minutes, stirring occasionally to disperse the heat through the solutions. Observe the color change. A blue color indicates a negative test for glucose, whilst brick orange or a reddish brown indicates a positive test. Note that failing solution does not give a quantitative indication of the amount of glucose in a solution. This means that it will either be blue or orange. Benedict solution, on the other hand, does give a quantitative indication of the amount of glucose, as it can turn or change into a range of colors to indicate the relative concentration of glucose in the solution. Lighter green and yellow indicates less glucose, and darker orange or red indicates more glucose. For the fat test, you need a fat-containing substance like oil, as well as ethanol and water. To perform the fat test, add some oil into one test tube and water into another. The water will again serve as the control. First, add about 5 milliliters of ethanol to each test tube. I've used rubbing alcohol, which I bought at my local pharmacy. Shake the test tubes well. Now add 5 milliliters of water to each test tube and observe the reaction. A clear solution indicates a negative test for fats whilst a cloudy or milky emulsion indicates a positive test for fats. If you found this video useful, give it a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new episodes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook to stay on top of the latest TAS news and launches. So that's it for now from The Answer Series, your key to exam success.